Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining me and the Albuquerque Historical Society today on Sunday, November 21st for a presentation on the history of Los Poblanos. Uh, my name is Kate Garner, and I am the Culture and Community Event Director here at Los Poblanos. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our property. We are a historic inn and organic farm located in the North Valley of Albuquerque in the village of Los Ranchos. Um, these days we operate as a boutique inn with about 45 guest rooms. Um, we have a wonderful lavender farm that many of you may be familiar with um, and a line of lavender care products. Um, we have a fabulous restaurant called Compo and our newly opened Hacienda Spa. So. We do run um, as a hospitality um, and retail business these days, but there is a very rich history associated with this land, um, an incredible cast of characters who have helped shaped it over the past 100 years. In my role here as the events director, I have the opportunity to share this history and these stories with our visitors on a regular basis. So when the Albuquerque Historical Society um, asked whether I would be interested in giving a presentation, I was very honored and uh, of course jumped at this opportunity since I, I do love to share these stories with a captive audience. Um, I have some slides prepared for, for today um, that show many great pictures from our archives, which I also help to manage here. And I have some actually rare historical footage, which we recently uncovered, which I'll be sharing with you as well, which is a, a glimpse back in time into 1935. Um, when this land was uh, used for some different purposes. So with that being said, I'm going to jump right in. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so you can see these slides and we'll go ahead and get started. So there we go. As you can see, uh, Los Poblanos was a thriving ranch property dating back to the 1930s. Um, I'm gonna be speaking a lot about the family that ran the, the ranch and owned the property and built many of these beautiful historic buildings in the 1930s. Their names were the Sims family, Ruth and Albert Sims. Some of you may be familiar with them as they were quite prominent citizens in Albuquerque. Um, we do know a little bit about the family that lived here prior to that. Um, for a period of time, this land was owned by the Armijo family in the, in the 19th and the early 20th century before it changed hands to the Sims family. So that's a picture of our beautiful barn, um, which is still standing to this day and was built in 1934, as you can see there. Um, I put in a, a shot of our, our iconic entranceway here with those towering cottonwood trees. Really the history of Los Poblanos is, um, is one that's really grounded in agriculture. And we're, our location right very close to the Rio Grande means we are in the Rio Grande bosque ecosystem. We have many of these beautiful native trees that grow up and down the river. Um, and this is sort of the, the introduction to Los Poblanos um, as it has been for the past hundred years or so. So I thought it was a, a fitting slide to share with you early on. Um, and then of course, these days, many people are familiar or associate us with our lavender. Um, the lavender really is a relatively recent um, addition to our farm. We've been growing lavender since 1999, and I'll tell you all about that part of our history as well. Um, but really, our agricultural roots run much deeper than that. Um, we also have some evidence that was uncovered during actually an archaeological dig that we did um, a couple of decades ago, actually, with UNM um, and found some remnants of Pueblin pottery on the grounds. And so we know that there almost certainly was an ancestral Pueblin settlement um, on the grounds of Los Poblanos or on the where we currently do live. And I like to acknowledge that as well. Um, okay. So there we go. Um, this is a photo of Ruth and Albert Sims. Um, again, many of you may be familiar with the Sims. There's the still the Sims building downtown and Albert G. Sims Park in the Foothills area. Um, Ruth and Albert have a fascinating backstory, one that really is integral to the development of Los Poblanos from the early 1930s on. Um, so Ruth and Albert, 
were actually met in a very interesting place, very far away from Albuquerque. They met in Washington, D.C. in 1929 when they were both members of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, Ruth was the congresswoman at large from the state of Illinois. She was one of the, the first female congresswomen in U.S. history. So she was in one of the first cohorts of Congress that had women as elective representatives. Before she was elected uh, to the House, she actually was a nationally known leader in the suffragist movement. She had actually toured all across the country campaigning for the women's right to vote before the 19th Amendment was passed. Um, and she was the daughter of Mark Hanna. So Ruth was really a woman who really often went by four, all four names. So Ruth Hanna, Hanna was her maiden name. Um, and her father, Mark Hanna, was a very prominent U.S. Senator from the state of Ohio, where Ruth was born. As a young woman, Ruth actually moved to Washington, D.C. to work for her father as a, a secretary while he was in the Senate. And while she was there, she met her first husband, and his name was Medill McCormick. Um, he was a member of the Chicago McCormick family. So very prominent, very wealthy family in Chicago that um, they own the Chicago Tribune and a number of other regional newspapers and had really made their wealth um, in, the, in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, so as a young woman, Ruth, Ruth met Medill and she, got, she married him and he, Medill was actually a, a, a congressman at the time and then she was instrumental in getting um, Medill elected to the US Senate as a representative from the state of Illinois. So she was very much born into a political family and then her first husband was also a politician as well. Ruth and Medill had three children together um, and Medill did pass away at a relatively young age leaving Ruth a young widow. Um, about five years after that, after his passing, Ruth decided to run for the House herself. Um, and she ran a very successful campaign. She was elected. And um, the story goes that she was seated right beside Mr. Albert Sims of New Mexico. And Albert Sims was also a widower himself. So they were both widowed. Apparently, they were the only widows in Congress at the time. And Although it sounds like a, a you know, bit of a matchmaking story that they were sitting right beside each other, apparently that is the case. And they struck up a friendship. Um, and that was in 1929. And then in early 1932, the two of them got married. So it was the second marriage for both of them. And that's what brought Ruth and her three children down to New Mexico. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide here. So when Ruth moved down to New Mexico, um, she set about building a beautiful family home for her new, you know, blended family to live in. I will mention that Albert Sims did not have any children with his first wife, and Ruth and Albert did not ever end up having any more children together. So it was just the three McCormick children that, that spent time down here. Um, the first building that they built at, on the Los Poblanos ranch lands was the Hacienda building. So that's a picture, um, that's what we're looking at here in this picture. It was built in 1932 by the architect John Gaw Meme. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Meme. He really is considered the most influential architect working in New Mexico in the 20th century. And here at Los Poblanos, we're very fortunate to have two original meme designed buildings on our property. This is the first one, the Hacienda, like I said, built in 1932. And then we'll talk about the second one, La Quinta, which he built after that. Both of these buildings are on the National um, Register of Historic Places because they're considered quite significant historically and architecturally. Um, so this building has five bedrooms that were built for, for Ruth um, and Albert and, their, and the McCormick children and a beautiful living room. We refer to it as the Sala Grande and dining room and kitchen all centered around um, a beautiful Spanish style courtyard. So we'll see some more pictures of this as we go along. Um, all right, perfect. Right there, we see some interior shots of the historic Hacienda. So this building really is considered um, a perfect representation of Meme's territorial revival architectural style. I'll be speaking a little bit more about Meme and his legacy as we go along, but I did wanna share um, some of these beautiful interior shots. So you can see over on the left, one of the hallways um, that leads from the dining room into the Sala Grande. 
the picture in the middle is, um, is a picture of the Sala Grande. So that's the family's living room. Um, and then the one on the far right is going to be that interior courtyard. Um, so you can see actually that beautiful star-shaped fountain. It's a Moorish style fountain. Um, and that still stands today for any of you who have been to Los Poblanos over the past few years um, and been inside the Hacienda building. I think you'll agree that really the interior and exterior of this building look remarkably similar these days um, as it does to when these photos were taken in about 1937. We still have that beautiful fountain. It does still work. Um, it has been retiled recently, but it's in the exact footprint that the, uh, the Sims and John Gaumeen put it in there. Great, there is a picture of John Gaumeen himself um, as a young man. I'll speak a little bit about Meme, uh, Meme's background, his biography, since it's an absolutely fascinating story as well. Um, Meme was actually born in Brazil, of all places. Um, his parents were missionaries working in Brazil, and so he lived there until he was about 16 years old. Um, and at that time, he uh, went to college at the Virginia Military Institute, like all many of the Meme men before him, he went there to study civil engineering. Um, so John got meme, uh, you know, his first job out of college, he got a great job working in New York, actually working for his uncle on the New York subway system. Uh, then World War I hit and he was, um, he did serve in the war. However, he was stationed in the United States for the duration of it. Um, and then right after that, he got another job actually for an American company that, that stationed him in, uh, back in Brazil. But how, unfortunately, when he got to Brazil, he contracted tuberculosis. So he came back to the United States to, to you know, see, seek medical care. And um, allegedly he went to his doctor's appointment in New York and his doctor advised him to go you know, seek uh, recovery, recu to recuperate in the arid West. And you know, he would have had his choice. Many of the Western states, Arizona, Colorado, Utah had had sanatoriums, places where people could recover from tuberculosis. Um, but apparently he saw a poster for the Santa Fe Railway and figured, you know, why not Santa Fe? He had no experience in the, in the Western state. So he, he took a chance and he moved to Santa Fe to um, recover in, at Sun Mount Sanatorium. Um, I like to mention that just because, you know, this small, seemingly insignificant choice that he made as a young man had an outsized impact on the state of New Mexico. And we're very fortunate that, that he ended up um, coming here since he really has contributed so much to the look and feel of this state um, since that time. So John Gaumeem spent about two years recovering at Sunmount. During that time, he was surrounded by architects and artists um, and other people who inspired him to actually change his career. So while he was trained as an engineer, um, after he had recovered his health well enough, to, um, to move on, he actually went to Denver to train as an architect. He spent about 18 months there and then he moved back to Santa Fe and that's where he set up his practice and where he, he worked for the rest of his career. Like I said, we have two beautiful John Gaumeen buildings here at Los Poblanos, but there really are, I mean, countless John Gaumeen build, uh, design buildings all across the state of New Mexico um, and a little bit beyond there. So in this photo beside, meme um, at the, we have a photo of the Zimmerman Library uh, at UNM, that's the one on the bottom. And then the one at the top is um, the Fine Arts Center in Colorado Springs. And those are really considered two of meme's other masterpieces um, in addition to, to the La Quinta building here at Los Poblanos. Okay, and speaking of which, there she is herself. So this is the La Quinta, uh, cultural Center at Los Poblanos, designed in 1934 by John Gaumeem. So after he had completed the um, Hacienda building, the family home for the Sims, he and Ruth Sims got together and sort of dreamt up the vision for, for what La Quinta would be. This building was always conceived as a sort of quasi public building, although it was still on private property, it really was built as an asset for the Albuquerque community um, in its capacity as a cultural center. 
So what we're looking at here, it's a U-shaped building that was oriented to be a perfect view of the Sandia Mountain. So you could sit outside and enjoy that beautiful pool on the deep set portal. Um, the north wing of La Quinta, so the one we're seeing on the, the right hand side there, that's what really constitutes the cultural center. There's a beautiful library and gallery inside, which we'll see some pictures of um, as we go through here. So this is one of the original artistic renderings um, of the La Quinta ballroom. So that's really what takes up the, the center part of the building, of that U-shaped building. Um, and I just love it. It sort of shows what it was the artistic inspiration for what this, what this room should really look and feel like before it was built. Um, this is a picture taken in 1937 of what the ballroom actually looked like. And again, for any of you who have been here in recent years, um, you'll be able to tell that this room does really still look quite a bit like that. The furniture changes around quite a bit, um, but the, the integrity of the, of the room remains very much intact, um, the, the way that Meme designed it and the way that it looked in the 1930s. Um, again, many of you, if you've had the chance to be here, you'll know, you'll be familiar with our iconic swimming pool out front of La Quinta. Um, it technically was the first in-ground swimming pool in Albuquerque, so it was a pretty big deal. It, uh, it's a very large pool, it's a very deep pool, and um, the Sims used it for swimming. So actually, I'll go back one slide there. I just love that. It's so charming seeing the girls out there. You know, they had pool parties and uh, and they, you know, invited their, their neighbors and acquaintances over to come and enjoy the pool on a hot summer day. There we go. So this slide um, sort of naturally follows the, the next one or the, the previous one. This is actually the old ladies changing room inside La Quinta for the, for the swimming pool. Those beautiful painted panels um, were completed by an art, were done, done by an artist named Paul Lands. Um, and we still actually have all of those panels. They were in that exact location in the La Quinta changing room um, until about eight months ago when we very carefully removed them and put them actually back over in the Hacienda building. So they moved locations, but now they're a feature of our ladies changing room for the spa over there. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the interior artwork um, and architecture of the La Quinta building, but before we get too far along, I did want to back up a little bit to explain how the Sims had the money that they did to develop this beautiful estate. Um, so both Ruth and Albert actually married into quite wealthy families the first time around, so the McCormick family money um, and then the, the money from Albert Sims's first wife both contributed to the the development of this of this property, especially the McCormick money, um, because they really were considered. I mean, they were one of the wealthiest families in the country at the time. And when Medill McCormick passed away, Ruth came into to quite a bit of that money. Um, if you're wondering, you know how, and this is like I said, all being done in the in the early 1930s, so it was still very much um, the depression at this time but they had quite a bit of family money through their first spouses. All right. So there are many notable artworks in and around La Quinta. Um, John Gaumim and Ruth Sims really wanted this building to be a representation of New Mexican craftsmanship. They employed, commissioned a lot of New Mexican artists and craftsmen to work on the property. Many of these artists were affiliated with the WPA movement as well, the Works Progress Administration um, project and FDR's project. Um, this is not considered a WPA building because it is on private property, but we do have many visitors that like to come to Los Poblanos that, that follow that era um, and like to see many of these artworks in person. So that beautiful mural on the left, that's actually an authentic fresco painted by the artist Peter Hurd in 1937. Peter Hurd was quite a well-renowned artist in his time. Um, he actually married into the Wyeth art family. If there's any art history buffs that are listening in, um, you may be familiar with the Wyeths, N.C. Wyeth and his children, Henriette and Andrew Wyeth. Um, so Peter Hurd married, married Henriette Wyeth and they settled in New Mexico and both had very successful art careers. Um, so that is a depiction of San Ysidro. 
San Ysidro is the patron saint of farmers and laborers. He's a Spanish saint, a very important saint here in New Mexico. Um, and he has acted as a symbol for Los Poblanos really since the 1930s. Our current day logo um, you know, for the, for the Los Poblanos business is actually still a, a depiction of San Ysidro very much as a nod to, that, to the, the historic roots of that. So that herd fresco um, is located outside on the South Portal wing. It's really well protected, tucked right back. And um, if you're ever here, you know, it's one of those sort of can't miss um, artworks that you have to kind of come and see in person to really understand the, the scale and the beauty of it. And then on the right hand side, we have a close up, a detail shot of some of the, it's actually the door handles and the locks. Um, going into the La Quinta building. There's a, a set, several that look like that. And um, those, all the ironwork here was all done by an artist named Walter Gilbert. Um, and you can see it's cut off there a little bit, but you can probably see that it's the, um, the, again, the figure of the farmer with the staff and then the angel and the oxen. Um, and so that little motif, the motif of, of San Ysidro is really, really shows up all across our property and specifically at Los Poblan or at La Quinta in, in a lot of the artwork. Um, inside the building, there is some beautiful original features as well. Um, on the right is an example of an original light fixture. Oh no, sorry, I mean on the left is an original light fixture done by Robert Woodman. Um, this idea, the, the style of it was sketched out by John Gaw meme, and then he, he commissioned Woodman to actually create it. It's a beautiful combination of punch tin, so very classic New Mexican art form, um, and then reverse painted glass there. Um, and then on the right hand side, those are that picture, so it's a carved wood door, it's one of four. And um, it was carved that the, those four doors were carved by Gustav Bauman. So that's really considered, along with the Herd fresco, one of the two most significant original artworks at La Quinta. Um, Bauman was very well known um, for his wood block or his woodcut prints during his career. I mean, his work is hanging in museums all across the state, really all across the country. Um, and we're very fortunate to have some original carved wood doors like that. They're just a decorative feature of La Quinta, um, but a very prominent one. And again, one that we have people that come to our property specifically to see those Bauman carved doors. Okay. So inside, like I said, there's two rooms that really constitute the cultural center wing, the north wing of La Quinta. The first is the library. Um, this is a more recent photo, so it's not, you know, the furniture and everything is not from the Sims era, but all of that shelving um, is original and the fireplace and everything. And um, yeah, the Sims did operate this as a lending library. So people could come in and borrow books. They employed a cultural center director that oversaw those activities as well as other public events that took place um, at La Quinta. And there's a photo of the room facing the library, our beautiful gallery. Um, it was used by the Sims in their time as a gallery as well. They hosted, you know, rotating exhibits in there. They also used it for um, a lecture series and public performances and meetings and things. So it was very much designed as a place for the, the community to gather um, and participate in those types of activities together. And these days we do still use it um, as a gallery as well. All right, so I put up um, a couple of slides, a couple of pictures here, specifically about Ruth, um, Ruth Sims or Ruth Hannah McCormick Sims. You know, she goes by all four of her names. Um, just be, just to speak to the the significance that she had her that you know she had throughout her lifetime. Um, she was a force to be reckoned with, absolutely by all accounts. She was quite outgoing, very, very social, um, and just someone that was, I think, sort of full of life, very gregarious. And so when she moved down to New Mexico after she was, um, you know, out of the, out of her role in Congress, she really set about having a huge impact on this, this city and state as well. Um, so before that time, actually, I put up this little <laughs> um, election poster 
to mention that she actually, uh, as soon as she was elected to the House, she pretty much immediately started her campaign for the Senate. Um, and so this is a poster from that campaign in 1929. Um, if she had been successful, if she had won her election, she actually would have been the first um, female US Senator. Um, unfortunately, she did not win. She did win her primary, which was um, you know, fairly surprising and certainly a huge accomplishment in its own right. And then she lost in the general election. And after that time, she was not, um, she didn't serve herself in elected office. Um, at any point, but she certainly stayed very politically active. Um, the Time Magazine cover that you see on the left um, was during the, there, during the time period when she was the campaign manager for Thomas Dewey's presidential campaign. So I believe she is considered technically the first female campaign manager of a presidential campaign. Thomas Dewey was the governor of New York um, and ran a very competitive uh, campaign that many, many of you may remember that. Um, I, it, part of U.S. history, and so Ruth Sims uh, did act as his campaign manager after she, that was actually while she was living in Albuquerque, she sort of toured across the country um, helping to run that campaign. So really a woman that was, that was ahead of her time and had an outsized impact um, on, on Albuquerque. I'll mention also that she, while she was here, she did um, found a couple of schools that are still in existence today. One of those is Sandia Prep, or as it was known then, Sandia School for Girls, um, as well as Manzano Day School. Both of those were technically um, founded by, by Ruth Sims. Um, and then they really, the Sims really were, were patrons of education. They also donated all of the land or, or most of the land that Albuquerque Academy now sits on and owns. So when the Sims lived here, it was a very large property. Their ranch was about 800 acres. And um, actually after Ruth's passing, um, Albert Sims donated uh, several hundred of those acres to Academy. Okay. So another woman that is associated with our history that, uh, you know, very much like, like Ruth Sims was ahead of her time, very successful in her field is Rose Greeley, who you see there on the left. Rose Greeley was a landscape architect and designer based in Washington, DC. The Sims knew her from their time living there. I believe she did some work for them um, actually at their home in Washington when they were living there when they were in, in Congress. Um, and then they decided to commission her to design some of the, the formal gardens here at Los Poblanos. So Rose Greeley was um, an early graduate of the, the, what I think it's called the Cambridge School of Landscape Architecture and Design. Um, at one point it was affiliated with uh, Harvard and MIT. It was a female college for, for landscape architecture and design. Um, Rose Greeley graduated there and then started her practice and she had a prolific career. She worked on hundreds of projects. Um, however, her only known work in the Southwest is here at Los Poblanos. So we still have to this day, the beautiful Greeley Gardens. This is a picture of that. Um, you can see it in full bloom. This was probably taken in late May or June when the, when the flowers really are um, going crazy. And yeah, so we still, um, maintain it very much in the style of how Ruth planned, or Ruth and, I should say, Ruth and Rose planned it together. The very formal Spanish style garden modeled after um, gardens in the Alhambra region of Spain. Um, many, many varieties of roses grow in there, but so do countless other, other flowers, including um, irises and lilies. We have a beautiful magnolia tree. We grow peonies. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful part of our property that sits right behind the Hacienda building. Um, so some of the, many of the features that, that Rose Greeley designed for the garden are still there. All the original garden beds and little paths that you walk through as you move through the garden. Um, on the left there is the original foot bath that is still there and it's just a very charming feature of the gardens and then a close up of those roses. Um, so Ruth Sims actually was quite a, quite a gardener herself, very interested in horticulture. Um, and we know that she experimented with growing many different varieties of flowers and specifically roses 
during uh, her time in Albuquerque. It was such a different climate and, and environment than she was used to in the Midwest. So I think she um, really enjoyed, you know, learn the challenge of learning how to grow things in this in this climate here. Um, Rose Greeley also helped to design the interior courtyard of the Hacienda building. So this is the structure that's right in front of the, the back rose gardens. You can see a little um, sketch of the, of the courtyard there with the star-shaped fountain. And again, this is a more recent photo taken of that Moorish fountain. Um, and many of the, the tree or the you know the vines and the the roses and things that are trellising around there are very similar to what would have been growing or what would have been um, selected by Rose Greeley during the design um, phase of, of her work in the 1930s. She was working with the Sims around 1933 to design all of these. All right. Um, I'm actually going to speak a little bit now about our um, agricultural roots. So we've talked a little bit more about the, the focus more on the architecture and the gardens of Los Poblanos up until this point, um, which is very, very an important part of our history. But really the agricultural side of things um, is absolutely fascinating and especially important to us now because we do still operate as a, you know, as a thriving farm um, these days and very much in a in the spirit of what the Sims did here. So you can see that big barn on the left. Um, that's what it was, the barn was being raised and we still have it to this day. We use it um, for all kinds of storage um, for our farm team with lots, lots of equipment in there. No, no dairy cattle these days anymore. Um, when the Sims ran their farm and ranch, um, it was a thriving dairy farm. So both Ruth and Albert um, actually owned dairy cattle. When they got married, they merged the two uh, herds of cattle together. So they had Guernsey cattle and Holsteins and they put them all together and they had about 400 dairy cows, if I'm remembering correctly. So quite a, quite a big herd and they did produce quite a lot of milk um, that was consumed really all across New Mexico during that time period in the 1930s until about the end of World War II. So it wasn't, it wasn't a long period, but it was a very successful dairy farm in its time. And the Sims um, did collaborate with some other dairy farmers and ranchers in the area to form sort of a, a collaborative or a co-op of sorts that became Creamland Dairies, which of course is still in existence today. So we have deep ties that go back to the, to the origins of Creamland dairies. And then over on the right, you see a great photo of our silos being built. And it is, looks like maybe they've only done one so far. So we do have, have two silos <laughs> there. Um, and those were actually the grain, the grain storage silos for the, uh, for the dairy cattle. Um, I love that picture because they're, again, the silos are, and the lavender fields and the, the cottonwood sort of entrance, the driveway are probably the three most iconic features of Los Poblanos. So you can see that going up. Oh, and there, there's a, some dairy cattle right there. And then the gentleman over on the um, right hand side, that is actually Albert Sims himself, some of his farmers, one of their prize head of cattle. And then the building in the back is actually what the old creamery building. So if you've been to Los Poblanos recently and you've been to our farm shop or compo, our restaurant, you've actually been inside one of uh, the historic dairy buildings from the 1930s. Those were, you can see, maybe you might recognize some of the shapes of it. The, the old dairy buildings are, you know, have been very much restored from their original uh, use and, and repurposed, but it is, uh, they are the farm shop and, and the restaurant are both in buildings that have been there since the 1930s as part of the, the dairy operations there. Um, the farm shop was actually the old milking barn building and we have, uh, we still have some of the original features of that preserved, like the sort of gently sloping uh, floors that were designed, you know, for the, the milk runoff during when the cattle, cattle were being milked. Um, we still have some of those features, which make it very charming, very interesting. Okay. 
Um, there is a great photo out in the field. So like I said, the, when the Sims lived here, it was a much, much larger property. It was um, about 800 acres or so, really cutting all across what's now Northern Albuquerque. So in a long, skinny tract of land all the way to the Sandia Mountains. Not all of it was, was actively farmed or ranched, um, but they did have, they did grow commercial crops as well. Um, looks like this is corn. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is very telling, you know, this was taken in the in the earlier mid 1930s, but it looks like it could have been taken, you know, even like 100 years before that. Um, Albuquerque was still, you know, somewhat of a, of a frontier town at that time. And it was, uh, this was this was definitely some, to some extent, out, outback living and, uh, and farming and considering, you know, this property is is very centrally located in Albuquerque now. You know, it's just a few minutes down the road to get to Old Town. Um, it's crazy that not even a hundred years ago, this land looked like that. Um, okay, so speaking of, uh, you know, farming and gardening, I like to put this picture in um, because this is another structure that we still have to this day. This is our historic Lord and Burnham greenhouse. So the Sims were very interested in experimental agriculture. They were constantly, you know, working with different plants and different crops, seeing what grows best in this climate. Um, and they built this beautiful Lord and Burnham greenhouse, which really considered, you know, one of the premier American manufactured greenhouses of the 20th century. And they did a lot of that work in the greenhouse. So we still have the greenhouse um, open and, and being used to this day, very much in the same um, vein as what the what the Sims used it for. Um, we, that's where we grow a lot of our, our lavender plants, which I'll speak more about in a few moments, as well as um, you know herbs and flowers. It's the home base for our distilling program. So very much still a mad laboratory and a source of our, our research and development here, just like the Sims used it for. Um, I'm gonna actually take a quick pause from the slideshow here, and I'm going to switch over to some of that historic film footage. Um, I'm actually going to let's see, stop that screen share and move over to this one. Okay, so I feel like I need to introduce this a little bit. I'm gonna start it off while I do that. So this is some, Film footage from 1935 that was recently uncovered, actually very recently. I'll make it a little bit bigger here, if everyone can see that. Um, in the process of some research actually on a, on a new book coming out in, a, in the future about Los Poblanos, um, this footage was uncovered and, and none, of men, none of us um, had really ever seen it before. So we feel very lucky to, to have got our hands on it. It is quite long, so I'm gonna cut cut into it a little bit so you can get a snapshot, but you can see, I mean, this is like we were just talking about right on the heart of the, the farmland that was the Los Poblanos Ranch looking out towards the Sandia Mountains. Um, and you can see the landscape. I mean, it, the view is the same, but the landscape looks quite a bit um, different at that time. Oh, I need to buffer a little bit here. So um, what we do know is that the Sims employed quite a few people. Um, at, at their farm and on their ranch. Um, this was during the depression, so they were um, certainly considered, you know, significant employers here at that time. I'm gonna pause it and skip forward a little bit. Oh. Might have to let that buffer a little bit. Oh, there we go, great. So you can see that's the old barn. Um, Again, you're probably very recognizable from that shape. Okay, this is from a, this seems to be a different event. We're not, we don't think that was actually at Los Poblanos. It seems to be some kind of outback event. Okay, there is a dairy, the dairy cattle in the old um, milking barn. So this is what is now the farm shop building. It's a little bit hard to see, but if it pans back a little bit, you'll probably recognize the shape of the building if, uh, if you have been to the farm shop at any point in the last few years. There's some more um, farming activity going on. So this video, we have two of these videos. This one really is focused much more on, on the farmland and then I have some of the buildings as well. Um, 
this is one of Ruth's children. I believe it's one of her daughters. Yeah. Um, so she had two daughters and one son who, who they were, they went to school, you know, out of state, but they, there's John, her son. Um, they did come back and stay at Los Poblanos, um, you know, when they were visiting their, their family. John, her son really was the golden child or her, her, her favorite child. I'm pretty sure self-proclaimed favorite child. Um, he actually died a, a fairly tragic, quite a tragic death. Um, when he was rock climbing in the Sandia Mountains as a young man. I think he was in his early 20s. And um, unfortunately, they, they believe he was struck by lightning and, uh, and his body was actually not found for about seven days. It's really a, tra a terribly tragic part of the Los Poblanos history. Um, but it was, a, it was made national news because of who, who Ruth was. And, you know, John was the, the son of Medill McCormick, a member of the McCormick family. So... Um, someone that would, you know, he really, if he wanted to go into politics, probably had a very, very bright future ahead of him with all of the political um, the le legacy in his family. Um, this is now cut back over to the dairy farm. And we do see Albert Sims actually here over on the side again. I just, you can see the greenhouse and some of the, the milking barns in the background there. I just love sharing this because it's, um, very much a, you know, a glimpse back in time to a property that is very familiar here, but, um, you know, looks dramatically different than it did in 1935. All right. So I think this, hopefully this gave you a bit of a sense of, oh, there they are again, <laughs> of what the farm looked like back in 1935. So what I'll do is actually pause that one and go over to our second video. Um, so this one starts right off um, in the Hacienda courtyard. There's Ruth herself, Ruth Hannah McCormick with some of her, her little dogs there and the, centered around the old, the Moorish fountain. Um, you can see the roses in the background. They're gonna go for a swim. <laughs> um, and if I cut ahead a little bit here, again, you're gonna see Ruth's daughter. It's just beautiful to be able to see, um, you know, the, the hacienda that the Los Poblanos Ranch homestead, the, the, the casita, the home of the family, um, just a couple of years really after it was built. And, um, you know, that's that iconic John Gaw meme, the territorial revival style architecture is really shining through there as it is, you know, it still does to this day. Cut forward a little bit. There she is at work doing pruning some of her, her plants. Those look like roses. We know she loved roses in particular. Um, and Ruth was a very hands-on person. I mean, she did a lot of, of gardening herself. Albert was very hands-on with the farm. He was, uh, yeah, definitely. Oh, there's Albert. We'll cut ahead a little bit to see Albert. He was definitely um, actively involved and um, both of them were sort of busybody types, I think. Um, there we go. Cut forward again a little bit here. And this is a beautiful, there we see the silos and you can see that these beautiful cutting gardens. So where a lot of their, their plants were grown. This is actually not the back gardens that we were looking at the Greeley designed gardens, but um, instead out the, the front closer to the silos. This is taken over um, at La Quinta. Not exactly sure who these people are. And there we go. And I'll show you a little bit of the back garden. Oh, you can see some of the acequia water. So that's the river, the irrigation water that um, flows through those historic acequia channels that we do still have here these days. Again, just a little bit of a, a glimpse into back in time in the, um, into the back gardens. These are going to be the Rose Greeley designed rose gardens, which you can see are just, just beautiful. There we go. All of that, all, all the features of the garden, not the furniture necessarily, but all of the, the paths and the, um, the little irrigation canals are still, still there the same way we see in 1935. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pause this. And I think we'll, we'll switch back over to the slides here. Okay. So I hope you all enjoyed that. It's definitely some footage that, that very few people have seen because we only uncovered it within the past few months here. And hopefully we'll be able to, to have other opportunities to show both of those films in their full length. They're about 35 minutes total. 
Um, and they're, they're really a treasured piece of our history now. Um, I wanted to show an interior shot of what our, our greenhouse looks like these days since that original um, Lord and Burnham 1937 greenhouse is still very much being actively used. This is all the little baby lavender plants and some other types of little seedlings that are getting their start here before they're planted out in the field. So a very special place to be in the winter and the summer as those are getting started. These days, you know, sort of just carrying on the, the thread of our agricultural history here. Um, you know, we don't have a dairy anymore. We don't have any livestock on the property, but we're best known for our lavender. Um, we have about two acres of USDA certified organic lavender um, that we grow on the property. And we've been growing lavender since 1999. Um, so the lavender that we grow is a variety called Grosso. Um, we grow it pretty much exclusively for our essential oil distillation. So we use a steam distillation process to extract the essential oil from these beautiful plants. And that's what goes into our, our Los Poblanos lavender product line. Um, the reason that we grow lavender here is because it is a crop that's very well adapted to the high desert climate. Um, most of what we grow now, you know, we're very conscious of our water usage. However, it's very important that we keep the grounds, you know, keep the property used for agricultural purposes. We have 25, we're on 25 acres these days, um, and, a, and a good portion of that is being used for um, actively being um, used for agricultural purposes. So the lavender is really the, the biggest part of that. Um, and we're able to grow it in an organic and sustainable manner. So that's really um, important to us here as well, sort of our part of our core mission around preservation and sustainability. You can see a great shot of our lavender harvest there. The lavender harvest is in June and July um, every year. And it's a great, you know, if you live locally, there are some opportunities to come and um, volunteer to help with the lavender harvest, which is a pretty special opportunity, as well as if you're staying at the inn, um, you know, every morning, if you want to get up early, you can go and help out with the harvest. Um, and then just a little picture of our product. So you can see um, you know, where that essential oil goes into. So things like our lotions, shampoos, soaps, things like that. Okay, so now is the point in the history um, where I really have the opportunity to speak about the family that currently owns and operates Los Poblanos. Um, and their name is the Remby family. Again, if you live in Albuquerque, you may be familiar with a member or many of the members of the Remby family. They have lived uh, on this property and owned the property since the late 1970s, right around 1976. Um, Penny and Armin Remby purchased the property or purchased the Hacienda building um, from the, the second generation of the Sims family. So after Albert, Albert Sims outlived Ruth Sims by about 20 years. Um, and then when he died, it was passed down to his nephew, Dr. Albert Sims and his wife, Barbara, they raised their own family on the property for a period of time, and then they sold it to the Remby family, to Penny and Armin. Penny and Armin raised their own four children in the Hacienda building, um, and it was just a private family residence um, for about 20 years. And then in 1999, that's when they opened Los Poblanos Inn, as we see here. Um, Penny and Armin made the decision to transform their family home into a historic inn. It was really just a little bed and breakfast at the time with um, just a few rooms, five or six rooms. And um, they did that as a means of preserving this old building. So, I mean, like countless historic properties across the country, really across the world, um, in order to be able to maintain and keep up um, these buildings in good condition, the Rembies decided to start a business. And that was just over 20 years ago, and it really has grown you know, quite significantly since that time. These are some great aerial shots, actually taken from a hot air balloon <laughs> of the Los Poblanos property. These days, you can see um, you know, that, there's, that there have been quite a few new buildings, like expansions to the inn that have been built. And then you know, in addition to the historic buildings as well, you can see all that working agricultural land, the lavender fields, and um, you know, all of our kitchen gardens where we grow fruits and vegetables and herbs to supply um, the restaurant here. So the, the, the growth and the vision for, for Los Poblanos as a business really is all a credit to the Remby family. 
Penny and Armin um, have four children and their youngest son, Matt Remby, is our executive director. And he's been running the, the business for almost 20 years now and has really helped to guide the growth that we've seen since it was just a little, a little bed and breakfast. Um, I put this photo up because this is a, a, a relatively new part of our, our story, the Los Poblanos story here, but another really interesting historical aspect. Um, so since our product line, the lavender product line and the, the farm foods product line is really growing quite significantly, we actually, um, the business bought a building down at 4th and Mountain. It's this building we're looking at here, the old tractor factory. And um, we moved our full production site downtown. Um, so it is all, you know, our products are all still made in New Mexico and many of them are made in, in this particular building here. And um, yeah, that was just in April of this year. It's sort of a new historic preservation project that we're taking on um, with the, the longer term goal of being able to open it up to the public and visitors as well. So while we have you know, all of the historic um, aspects and building of our, of our farm property, we now have this new, new property more in downtown Albuquerque that we're really excited to, to explore and that history and share it with, uh, with visitors as well. Um, so there is a family photo of the Remby family with Penny and Armin um, seated right in the middle of the front row there. Um, and then you can see Matt and his siblings, Jay, Armin Jr. and Emily and their spouses in the back row and then all the grandchildren um, in the front row as well. So it really is a family um, you know, run business. Many of us that work here feel very, very privileged to be working for a family with such a great vision and such a dedication truly to historic preservation um, and some really creative ideas about how to, how to maintain and how to celebrate this historic property here. Um, I had to put in a, a close up, a closer up shot of Penny and Armin since they really, you know, they started the business here. They're the ones that felt so passionate about the history of Los Poblanos, of the John Gaw meme buildings, of the agricultural roots, and really came up with um, an incredibly creative and dynamic business model to help be able to preserve this for, for many, many years to come and hopefully, you know, contribute to a lot, the long time, the long term legacy of this property and what it means. The next slide here. Um, so I, I put that up. That's a great picture of, of Armin Remby, Dr. Remby, um, with the lavender in the background. I believe this was taken at one of the, the lavender in the village festival. So if you live in Albuquerque, you're probably familiar with that festival and that. Um, was actually started by the Rembies on the Los Poblanos grounds um, back in the day. And now it's sort of outgrown that. So it doesn't take place at Los Poblanos. It's actually been um, taken over by the, the village of Los Ranchos as a fundraising event for them. Um, but yes, uh, Armin Remby and, and Penny were both integral in the, in the inception of the idea for that festival and really you know, educating people um, about growing lavender and distilling it there. Um, many, many of you may know that um, sadly, Dr. Remby did pass away this year at the end of April. So that is a, a significant loss that we're still feeling, you know, the impact of every day here and will for, for many years to come. Um, he was just an amazing man, very curious, very generous. Um, and one of the ways that we've decided to honor his legacy is actually with a new lecture series of our own. So that's why I put up that little <laughs> shot on the left there. Um, so we announced the, the Dr. Armin Remby lecture series at La Quinta um, a few months ago, and we had the inaugural lecture in October given by Wes Brittenham, our director of horticulture here. We had the second lecture just, um, just over a week ago given by Professor Chris Wilson um, of UNM on the subject of John Gamim and territorial revival and his work with the Rembies on historic preservation over the past 20 years. Um, and it is gonna be a regular recurring monthly lecture series. So you know, honoring Dr. Remby's le uh, legacy and the, the subjects that he was really interested in and passionate about, um, it is fully open to the public and those are all listed on our website. So um, on our events calendar on our website. So hopefully some of you may be interested in coming to join us. It's a great way to come in side the La Quinta building and really be able to take it in um, and attend a, a special event here. So I want to say thank you to all of you for listening to this presentation on the history of Los Poblanos. 
Um, I'd be very happy to open it up to questions now. I did put my contact information up there as well. If you'd like to take it down um, and you enjoyed this presentation or you have questions or you think of things later on, please feel free to contact me. I love engaging with people um, about the history of this incredible property. And uh, yeah, or if you're planning to you know, stop by, um, please do drop me a line and I would love to meet you and show you around here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my slides here so that I'm able to access the chat. And I can see some questions that have already been coming through. So I'll start addressing these sort of one by one. Um, and as they come in, I'll, I'll you know be happy to do my best to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, okay. So one of the questions was before the Remby own, before the Rembys owned the property, was La Quinta ever in decline or at risk? Um, it was somewhat in decline. It hadn't fallen into disrepair or anything like that. Um, there was actually a period of time where Armin, so Dr. Remby's sister um, and her husband, the Walkers, actually owned La Quinta, the southern half of the current day property. Um, and then when the Walkers decided to sell the, their half of it, that's when Penny and Armin bought the Southern half and reunited the, the two John Gamin buildings and the two components of the, you know, of the historic property. And that's when they started the business. Cause at that point, you know, they really had taken on quite a lot and, um, you know, in order to be able to, to preserve it um, and make sure it didn't fall into disrepair um, or decline it, you know, that's why they needed the new revenue streams from the lavender and then also from, from the inn, from the hospitality side of things. So it never fell into disrepair, luckily. Um, and, you know, it's been maintained and preserved over the years with various projects um, in order to make sure that it's still, it's still in good shape. Um, okay, another question that came in was, is all of Los Poblanos a business or is it a 501c3? So it is, it is a business. Yeah, we, we are not five, a 5013C3, but we um, are, it's really what we consider a triple bottom line business, a business that is firmly grounded in sort of the three tenets of sustainability. So of course, environmental sustainability, and then economic and social sustainability as well. So really looking at um, creating a business that, that does good in the world and, and gives back to the community. Um, okay, there's a question about farm hands, whether farm hands lived on site. There were farm hands that lived on site um, in the Sims era. There was definitely housing for some of the staff and the employees. Um, these days, none of the employees live on the property. Um, but Penny Remby does, does still live on the property. So she's lived here for, I mean, going on 50 years now. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, okay, so yeah, there are some questions coming in about the, about the lecture series. That's great. So the, the, our lecture series that we just started, the Dr. Remby um, lecture series is, again, sort of a very intentional nod to what the Sims did. They had a lecture series here in their time, and really La Quinta was built for that type of public cultural programming and events. Um, so we do use the La Quinta building for private events as well. We do beautiful weddings here. Um, we also host our, our twice weekly afternoon tea service here. So every Wednesday and Sunday afternoon, we hold a formal tea service here that again, anyone can um, you know, make a reservation for to come inside and enjoy the space. And then the lecture series is very much a continuation of that. Um, so it is, uh, it's, uh, the lectures are always on Wednesday evenings. The all the detailed information about it um, is on our events calendar on our website. So if you go to lospoblanos.com and then you click on calendar, you'll see those the, the lectures come up there. You may need to you know search for lectures or, or filter it so you can see all of that. But we do host, you know, in addition to the monthly lectures, we do host um, regular guided tours of the property as well. The information about the afternoon tea is up there as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for people that are, you know, interested in coming to the property, learning about the history, learning and learning about some of these subjects that we care deeply about, you know, of course, including agriculture and art and architecture and good food and wine and all the things that really make Los Poblanos what it is. Um, so the lectures are all up there on the website. Um, 
you do have to reserve a ticket. So yes, they do fill up. So we have um, the December and January lectures are currently posted. The December one, I believe, is sold out. It's actually um, on the topic of, of Gustav Bauman. We have Tom Leach, who is one of the uh, curator at the um, the Palace Press in Santa Fe, and he's a you know very very familiar, very very well educated on Gustav Bauman's career, and um, actually has written a couple of books about him. So he's coming down to give the December lecture, which I think is sold out, but we we do have a wait list going as well. Um, and then our January lecture, which I believe there's still some tickets for, is actually going to be a flamenco performance um, and, a, and a little talk on the history of flamenco in Albuquerque. And then the next four lectures, so February through May, will be announced um, within the next couple of weeks. So those will come out through our email newsletter list and then also be posted on our events calendar on the website. Um, Okay, so I'm happy to stick around. I think we'll wait maybe another few minutes or so, see if there are any other questions that come through. Um, it looks like people are enjoying the, the presentation, so I'm very glad to hear that. It really is, uh, it's an amazing place. I will say I, I'm lucky I had a little, um, what I consider sort of Los Poblanos University period um, during the, you know, the really the start of the pandemic in March and April of last year, we were closed, the business was closed for about six weeks. Um, and during that time, I actually got to rearrange and completely catalog our archives here. So I got to hang out in the La Quinta library and go through all the documents we had, you know, from the Rembi era and many things from the Sims era as well, um, and be able to, uh, to catalog all of that. I learned a lot of a lot about the history, a lot about the people during that time period. So that was a, a silver lining during the, the early part of the pandemic. Um, I will mention that the, the grave site of both of the Sims, actually Ruth and Albert, um, are buried at the historic Fairview um, Cemetery here in Albuquerque. So that's something if you wanna go and pay, pay your respects to the Sims, you can go in uh, and see them over there. Um, great. We'll wait a couple more minutes. It looks like maybe there's still a few questions coming through here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, if that, that might be the end of the questions. If you can think of anything, definitely send them in now. Um, but thank you for joining us. I know um, some of you probably were watching live, others may be tuning in a little bit later to the recorded version of it. Um, but a sincere thank you to all of you for, for taking an interest in this subject and uh, yeah, listening in. Hopefully you learned something about the history of Los Bolanos today. Oh, one other question just came in. Can the public tour the back gardens? That's a great question. Currently the back gardens are close to some of our guest rooms. So you do have to be staying at the inn in order to actually go and see those historic Greeley gardens in the back. The best way for the public um, to be able to, to see those gardens is to um, sign up for one of our tours. So the tours are, the tour dates are all posted on the website. Um, again, on the events calendar. Um, if you are with one of the tour guides, then we'll walk back through the gardens and that's really the best way to see it. Um, specifically in the spring, so March, April, May, you know, even into June, we hold, we host um, garden specific tours because that's when they're really thriving and in, in peak bloom. Um, so we have, yeah, like specific gardens or tours specifically on the gardens of Los Poblanos. And I'll give you a little preview that one of the upcoming lectures is actually going to be specifically on the history of the gardens of Los Poblanos as well. So if you are interested in learning more about Rose Greeley and, uh, you know, a lot of the landscape designing around the gardens, then definitely keep an eye out for the, the future lectures. Um, okay. Um, I'll also mention, since we're talking about tours, um, guests that attend our afternoon tea service at La Quinta are also invited to join a little docent-led tour. 
Um, so that's not a property wide tour. It's just centered on this building in particular, but a chance to learn about, you know, some of the artisans and craftsmen who worked on the building, John Gamim, who designed it a little bit about the sim. So it's a, it's a relatively short tour. It's about 20 minutes. Um, but we thought it was important to be able to combine that with the, um, you know, you come for a culinary experience, you enjoy your afternoon tea, and then you get a little bit of, a little bit of culture and history with, uh, with that experience as well. Okay, I think we may have come to the end of the questions. So um, if you can think of anything else, please do email me at my, my work address or my work email address, which is kgarner, so the letter K, G-A-R-N-E-R -E at lospoblanos.com. If you can think of anything else, I'd be happy to, to answer it there. So once again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And um, thanks to the Albuquerque Historical Society for inviting me to give this presentation. Take care.